I'm Sherry Castellano with the Curative Education, and on behalf of MOCA's staff and Board of Trustees, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Stephen Fleischman Lectureship, featuring Bill Wiege on his longstanding friendship and artistic collaboration with Sam Gilliam. The lectureship honors the 25th anniversary of Stephen Fleischman's tenure as museum director. Members of MOCA's Board of Trustees who served during that time funded an endowment to provide for an annual lecture by individuals who have made exceptional contributions to art and culture. Talks organized for the Stephen Fleischmann Lectureship are held each year in April and have free admission in recognition of the museum's dedication to providing access to opportunities for learning and enrichment. We'd like to thank Wisconsin Public Television for their permission to screen excerpts from a story originally aired on Primetime Wisconsin that brings Sam Gilliam's voice into this conversation. Tandem Press generously provided photographs from their image arc library and Gregory Conniff and Bill Wiege shared photographs from their personal archives for tonight's presentation. Born in Tupelo, Mississippi in 1933, Sam Gilliam is internationally renowned for innovations that led the way toward a new vocabulary for abstract painting. Among his most celebrated contributions are his drape paintings, including Carousel, painted in 1970 and seen here on the right on screen as it is installed in Big, an exhibition of large-scale works from Emoka's permanent collection on view in the second floor galleries. Prolific in his production, Sam Gilliam is known for always pushing the boundaries of his medium. And for more than four decades, he has found a kindred spirit in Bill Wiege. Bill Wiege is Professor Emeritus of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Art Department, proprietor of the Jones Road Print Shop, and founding artistic director of Tandem Press. He has been described as a consummate toolmaker whose ingenuity in applying various technologies to the making of art allowed the artists with whom he has collaborated to break new ground in their artistic production. Bill also is celebrated as an artist in his own right for his landmark work in print media and handmade paper. Born in Wisconsin in 1935, he studied printmaking, collage, and sculpture at the University of Wisconsin-Madison prior to joining the art department faculty in 1971. By that time, he had already become well known for his works made in protest to the Vietnam War, an appointment as director of the Smithsonian Institution's National Collection of Fine Arts Experimental Printmaking Workshop at the 1970 Venice Biennale. Throughout his career, he has energetically pursued new artistic territory through continual experimentation and innovation. To the left of Carousel is a work by Bill from 1977 made of cast paper on string that is also featured in Big, and along with Carousel is among the most important works in Emoka's collection. Bill is joined on stage by Emoka Curator Emeritus Richard H. Axum. Rick joined Emoka's staff in 2006 and in his role as curator, organized numerous exhibitions drawn from the museum's permanent collection. He has also curated exhibitions on the graphic work of Jasper Johns, Ellsworth Kelly, Klaus Oldenburg, Robert Rauschenberg, and Frank Stella. Rick is Professor Emeritus of Art History at the University of Michigan, where he taught courses on modern and contemporary art for 28 years. He is a nationally recognized art writer who has published extensively in the area of the modern and contemporary print including definitive texts on Frank Stella, Klaus Oldenburg, Terry Winters, and Ellsworth Kelly. Rick is currently at work on a print catalog resume for Terry Winters. So now please welcome Bill Wiege and Rick Axum. Well, thank you, Sherry, very much. And it's a pleasure to sit down with, with Bill and chat about his friendship and collaboration uh, with Sam, Sam Gilliam. So let's just get right to it. Um, uh, Sam, um, I mean, Bill, you first met Sam through the visiting artist program in the Art Department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the fall of 1972. The year before, he had soon assumed an assistant professorship in the Art Department teaching <laughs> printmaking uh, and related sorts of courses uh, to printmaking. Um, Bill, tell us about your years leading up to the first meeting with Sam um, and about what you were doing in your art and art making. I'm thinking of the political posters, the 1970 Venice Biennale, uh, and also <coughs> opening um, your Jones Road print shop and stable. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> um, I was a student here, obviously, at the university, and I built my own empire as a student. Um, they hired me here, much to their dismay, I think. Um, 
Uh, well, anyhow, I, I would rather talk a little bit about the museum here because I was involved very early on uh, with the museum. A very good friend of mine who was a collaborator with Sam and I, Joe Wilfer, when I met him, was the janitor. And, and he worked his way up to be the director. <laughs> uh, <coughs> well, anyhow, he, he was involved in the purchase of Big Carousel downstairs. And he and Don Eiler went out to Washington to pick it up. The cost of the, the piece at the time was $3,500. So, Steve, I'll give you seven grand for it right now. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> well, I'll give you 21,000. Half a mil? Well, it's probably worth a million. You're right. Well, anyhow, uh, I, I, after the, that program, uh, uh, shutting down the Art Center, almost doing it, I, I went off to Venice, Italy to uh, show my work there and to be the director of the Venice Biennale uh, print shop at the American Pavilion. I did get a bit of trouble there because I was in, uh, doing impeach Nixon posters at the time. And uh, being a government employee, especially for the State Department, <laughs> you, were, you were not allowed to give away government property. Uh, so what I did is I, uh, I, I started uh, selling the prints for 50 lira, and, which is eight cents, so, you know. And uh, they don't like that either. So, <laughs> I kind of, uh, you know, got into trouble, but I, right now the Smithsonian's up interviewing me about the whole 70s Biennale because uh, not much was written about it. At the time, the artists around the world were pulling their art out of public museums and institutions uh, in protest for Vietnam. So, uh, and the only reason I went there, because it happened before I went, is because I did social comment. I've done it, and I'm doing it again. Um, I had a, recently had a show in uh, uh, Chicago that showed my old work, <coughs> which I was very pleased with. It's, there's a big catalog here. By the way, these catalogs are available for sale. They're 40 <laughs> bucks a piece, and all the proceeds go to the museum. I guess you can go on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <That's fun>. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, you know, if I do this monologue for 15 minutes, you know, I figured it out. If we go the full hour, I could talk for each year that Sam and I worked together. I had one minute and seven and a half seconds. But if I do this 15 minute monologue, I only have one second. So what I've decided we should probably do, we should have another group of things that happen after this, like forum or something, and I would spend an hour on each year I spent with Sam. Yeah. No, I'm not doing that, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go, Ray. <Rick. laughs> uh, uh, you, know, you, you mentioned, you mentioned Joe, Joe Wilfer. You know, yes. Obviously very important to this institution. Uh, he was assistant director of the Madison Arts Center from 60, 68 to 76, and then uh, director until 1980. And in the early 70s, he opened up the upper upper U.S. paper mill, which yes. was a hand handmade paper a facility. Yes, um, in an old barn. In an old barn, mm -hmm. right, right. And, and you were telling me that he, he, he was important, an important influence on what you were doing. Can you talk about that? Well, certainly, he, he uh, uh, I would have nothing to do with paper. I thought it was, you know, crafty thing happening. Of course, me being an artist, I would. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Joe, Joe was really into it. He loved doing it. He could do it really well. And uh, he worked with, uh, like, Alan Shields that worked with me. He worked with Sam a lot. I mean, he could make the lumpiest paper you could ever imagine, and that's what we liked. Uh, with texture, lots of texture. Look at Sam's new work. It's not done. It's amazing. But anyhow, um, and then I, uh, I kind of, uh, I don't know. I was invited to teach it in Davis, at California, and I was also invited to work at the experimental print shop with uh, Garner Tullis. So on the way out, I had a revelation uh, while just driving through the Great Lake, Great Salt Lake Flats. It was a tremendous snowstorm, and. Uh, 
it was, the snow was sticking on everything. And I thought, this is what I'm going to do. Alan Shields had worked with Joe, and he'd take a single string of paper, he'd put it in a bag, fold it up, and put it down, and try it. I thought, heck, I'm going to make a frame, and I can do all kinds of things. So I did that, and I started making paper in San Francisco, where I, where I started. I finally gave it up and joined the crafty people, you know. So, <laughs> so, so uh, uh, then, of course, uh, working with Sam, uh, meeting him in 1972, uh, he came out to my studio, which happened to be in Barnacle at the time, an old cow barn, and uh, what should we do? I, I didn't know Sam very well at that point, but I said, what? he said, what can we do? I said, well, what do you want to do? He says, I want to paint. I says, okay. There's an offset proving press. There's paint on the bed over there, and I'll run over the ink that you paint, and then I'll transfer it over to the paper on the other side. And that's what we did. That was our first edition that we did. I think we're all sold out of those now, so sorry. Uh, <laughs> there, there you go. There we are. Yeah, there. Oh, he's signing him with a with a BB gun. Every it's a, a shotgun. It's a, it's, a, it's a pencil tied to a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sam and I, you know, he 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 thought working with me was like a vacation. I don't know. And and you know, he came out in the summer for you know, 40, 45 years, and he and he initially he brought his children along, uh, and so they 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 worked with my children, and uh, they. We had horses and stuff like that, so there was a great time for them to come out. Uh, and at first, Sam kind of thought prints were just, eh, just ex entertainment or something to do with that. <laughs> and eventually, he found out that that wasn't the case, that they actually had some value. Um, it's hard to convince people, some people, that prints have a value. Uh, even myself, I wonder once in a while. Uh, so it just continued to happen. Uh, he, he did a lot of painting while he was, while I was figuring out how to produce what he was suggesting. And uh, so we had a, a number of very innovative uh, moments that happened. We have a fellow right here in the second row back, Paul Douglas, who came out for one of our more uh, adventurous uh, episodes. We, made, we, we tried making paper with styrofoam uh, as, a, as a receptacle you know, to make this thing. Then we tried to print with the styrofoam. And uh, I thought they were the worst things I'd ever seen in my life. But I, what did I know? I mean, it, they're really hot items. And it's like, OK. So I, sometimes I don't understand what he's doing. But, and sometimes I don't think he did either. But it, we continued. We marched on. And, and when Sam uh, came out, I pick him up in the airport. He said, which way do you want to go? We want to go through town or in the country? He says, in the country. So when he got to my studio, he had some ideas about color and about rhythm and about all kinds of things that would happen with the production that year. Uh, and, and the interesting thing about Sam is he's very, very generous. He also, uh, well, I had all those grad students around working with us. And he would like hold impromptu seminars uh, with them. And I had to sometimes break it up to get you know, a little production going. Um, that happened quite a bit. Um, and I, I just kind of sat down and thought, how, how, many pieces, how many pieces did we do together? Well, uh, Madison Art Center has a catalog, too, that they put together of, of my Johns Road print shop and stable. And they, uh, <coughs> uh, in there, I see that we did 50 editions. Mm. Uh, during, during that 10-year period. And, and then I tried to figure out how many monotypes did we do, how many single pieces that we did series, but they were all different, you know, pretty much different. And I, th I come up with a number like uh, 150, uh, 1,500 pieces, 1,500 mm -hmm. pieces over this span of time. And probably it was more. So we, we produced a lot of stuff. And uh, it, was, it was always fun. Sam worked at Picnic Point Press. He was the very first artist to go to Picnic Point Press. And uh, he, I don't see any students here. Are there any students here from them? No? No collaborators? Wow. Anyhow, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so they, they were there. 
And uh, Picnic Boy Prints has run through, I think, about 350 grad students in the program. So. You know, that's Sam in, the, in Tandem's workshop. Oh, yeah, and okay. You, um, well. And you did the poster, right, for him? Yeah, yeah. I did this po the first poster I did. I don't know if we got a photo. But the first poster I did before I ever met him, I just kind of knew what he did and made a poster. It was quite kind of successful. And I think he, get, he talked here, too, during that time. Um, this, the, these, this press that I, uh, I did, it's, uh, let me see. Oh, yeah. I, it's a, just a, a regular old etching or woodcut press, and, and I created a, a web press. The uh, U.S. government, uh, Sam, went, you know, he lives in Washington. He's been in Washington. He knows people in the government. He, he knew people in the arts program. So Sam said, where do you want to go? He says, I think we can get a, we can get a gig in uh, Korea. He said, would you go? And I said, I said sure, that'd be fun. <laughs> uh, and uh, he, said, uh, I, he said, what should we do? I said, well, why don't we make the world's largest print, you know? And so he <laughs> said, yeah, OK. So, you know, he's, he's known for taking the, the, the paintings off the stretcher. Well, he's also known now, for me, taking the print out of the frame, you know. You know, these things turned out, we, we probably printed over the years, uh, oh, I don't know, probably about 20 football fields lined up back to back. I can't hmm. tell you. <laughs> we actually did, well, we did a number of pieces. We did uh, the one in, in Seoul, Korea, and that was an interesting process where uh, we went in with the piece and we got it kind of up and the curator was upset with me running the cables around and moving big blocks of uh, display walls and so uh, he, I was reprimanded and of course <laughs> because of my behavior and, uh, and uh, so he took over and we had a lot of the stuff draped over these big walls and stuff like this. And, and he took over and, and dumped the whole thing. It went like a bunch of dominoes. All these big walls fell down. <laughs> and it was like, uh, yeah, I got uh, here it comes. There it is. There it is. And uh, so uh, at that point, Sam said, leave it. <laughs> he, says, he says, now we got to have strobe lights. Because <laughs> the piece is titled Ferris Ferris wheels and fireflies. And fireflies and Ferris wheels, right? Yeah, or something yeah. like that. And uh, so we went, we go to a downtown Seoul, you know, and we find a shop where we get their blinking lights. So we stop in there; it's about this wide, and we say we want two hundred strobe lights. <laughs> and it's like this shop doesn't have two hundred, but this guy runs off on his bicycle, come back, two hundred of them. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> so we take him back to the to the museum, and. Uh, wired them together, and our curator friend helped us. And we went to plug it in, half of them blew out because he didn't know how to do electricity. Uh, but the children came, and uh, they, the children had just a ball in there. They had never seen anything like it. It was so, so fantastic. They could, they, these people who are normally, they, these children are normally very well behaved, just lost it. You know, and the, and the families, families couldn't get him out of there. It was kind of, it was, it was one of the most beautiful things. <clears throat> you know, Noah, and you, um, you, it was funny you mentioned they got lost in the work. I mean, the well, yeah, they could crawl around in it and out of it, down. I mean, everything was secured. I don't think that those walls <laughs> were going to fall anymore. <laughs> and I just, I, I, I'm sure you probably are following us that, you know, uh, Bill worked with, with Sam in creating you know, new editions and prints and works on paper, but also there's this crossover uh, in, 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 in Bill's collaboration with Sam on the draped paintings. So they sort of run in together. You know, of Fireflies and Ferris Wheels was first presented in South Korea in 1991, and the following year in, in Finland. Um, and let's go, there's another clip here, a clip. Uh, from prime, prime Time, Wisconsin, which also gives you, you know, just further visual insight into what um, their process was, their working <coughs> process. 
artists often have a childlike sense of wonder and discovery that fuels their work. Most artists work alone, but sometimes artists work together as collaborators. Sam Gilliam is a well-known abstract artist and teacher from Washington, D.C. Bill Wiege is a professor, printmaker, and director of Tandem Press for the UW-Madison. They've been working on projects together for the last 17 years. We talked to them about their longtime collaboration, their ongoing project, and their ideas on art. Every year that Sam comes out, okay, it's like, what are we going to do this year, you know? And it's a whole new ball game, and it's fun. It's not like we continue to turn out the same thing year after year. It's, it's always a new, a new sport, a new, new game. I used to play at being in a circus. In fact, I, I played at being in a circus so much as that I was a full-time acrobat. <laughs> but here, I think that um, someone once said is that uh, how are you able to do these things in art as a man? He says, because I defined them when I was a child. So I think that both processes sort of close up and go together. There is a lot here. There is a lot that, that um, a, a feeling of survival away from being in cities, away from being in the closeness of cities, and a, a great deal of openness, and um, a great deal of uh, refurbishing sort of things that are in you that you don't know about, you know. And I've sort of, I've sort of liked it for about 18 years, I think, and that's been, been very, very good. It's, um, it's been kind. I've always liked Sam's work. I like, I like his use of color, his use of forms, I mean, all, of, all of those things he just called on and on. But again, it's his willingness to try new things and a willingness to go ahead and, and uh, I offer up some ideas and, and uh, usually takes them and they, they don't come out at all like I would have guessed, you know. So that's very exciting for me. I became an abstract painter because I wanted uh, to to sort of get further out than anyone else. And one night is that we were talking about those of us who were far out. And someone says, you aren't far out at all, <laughs> told me. So that I became involved in the process as well, I will show you how far out I could actually get. So that, um, and with encouragement, is that I started to, to make these paintings that were extension drapes that were extension of painting. Sam Gilliam's straight paintings made quite an impact on the art world 20 years ago. Since then, he has been commissioned to create works for various galleries and museums. Gilliam is in the first phase of working his installation of Ferris Wheels and Fireflies, a colorful and theatrical piece that will tour Japan and Korea in 1991 as part of the Arts America Cultural Exchange. The work began last December at Tandem Press. You know, that's the exciting part of collaborations is that you never, you, you put more things in the pot and you're going to get a better stew, you know, than you do if you have a couple of things. I, and it boils down to the thing that two heads are better than one, you know, and in the end. Greg Conniff is a photographer and writer who has known Sam Gilliam and Bill Wiege for 17 years. I became involved with Bill at the time he was setting up the Jones Road print shop. Um, I, I tore the dairy barn apart that became the print shop. I wound up as his first apprentice. And Sam was, I think, the second artist that came to work at Jones Road. And that's how I got together. And I just stood there. I knew uh, nothing about printmaking. That's why I wanted to work with Bill. I hadn't gone to school to study this sort of thing. And basically learned from working with Bill and uh, his open way of dealing with things and working with Sam, uh, learned about uh, how you make art in there. Uh -huh. So. That's the limit to start. What I've researched is that in most Oriental countries, there's, I don't think they're as abstract. What they sense is more the obvious, more, they're more formal. They sort of put up with less. Maybe they want to know the, you know, sort of the exact meaning. So first of all, I've only started to work with sort of exact symbols like Ferris wheel, fireflies, and things like this. This is what I'll be building uh, in paper in neon, and also sort of in, in uh, quasi savage between prints and, and, and painting. Then I thought this morning as I was on the plane that why not the word peace, and to make that very obvious, and that um, 
and I'll see where that gets me. Well, the people who uh, actually watch the collaboration, uh, what they get out of it is the enormous sense of possibility in the world. Try anything. Try anything. Even if it doesn't work, you've gotten off the dime. You've started. The printing part of it is very simple. We actually made relief plates. We carved away areas that didn't print. We applied ink to the surface that did print, the, the, the remaining surface printed. These uh, were repeated on the boards, but in random patterns and uh, using varying colors. Normally when a person makes something, they like to look at it. <laughs> and it's very difficult to look at something that's 100 yards long in a 50-foot studio. At the end of January, on the day when the temperature was minus six below, the printed work was taken outdoors and spread on frozen Lake Monona. The frigid weather didn't seem to put a chill on the enthusiasm for the work. It gives you another perspective, gives you some ideas. And uh, I think taking it out on the lake was just, you know, uh, kind of maybe a, a, a childish uh, kind of thing. And at the same time, everybody enjoyed it a lot. Everybody was happy, and we were freezing to death, and everybody's excited. So what's wrong with that, you know? <laughs> By April, the weather has improved, and Gilliam returns to Wiggy's farm in Arena, about 40 miles west of Madison. They continue painting the work outdoors, gaining new energy. And then here on the outside, I think that Bill had provided the proper environment for it. I think I've grown up a lot. I've grown up a lot, and uh, I've come back to doing things that I hadn't done since I was a child. And I've had a lot of fun at it, a lot of success. I mean, I know what I'm doing. That's good. So I have a lot of success at it. I think that there is that real false sense of what art is. One, in terms of cities, is that one doesn't define at least the real sense of openness. Probably most of the art in this country is made, in, made somewhere in a rural area. It's really defining art in the way that I think of it. We've also painted on the things. We've used a number of techniques of painting. We've used uh, spraying the paint on. We've thrown the paint on. Uh, we've rolled the paint on. Uh, oh, we used the broom to push the paint around with. We drug it across the field, so we picked up a few grains of sand that stuck to some of the paint. All these things, you know, are just the very beginnings of, of this piece. Sam is also working on other elements of the piece in Washington. It'll be very interesting to see these two things come together, too, uh, from two different sources. One of the unknown factors in producing this piece is the reaction the work will have on an Asian audience. Uh, that's the hardest thing that people have said that I'm going to be able to deal with because the Japanese um, uh, don't want to deal with uh, Afro-Americans, so to speak. Some people say worry about it, some people say don't. I know that when I was in Japan for 18 months is that it was the most interesting thing. It was exciting, um, you know, for the two of us. So maybe uh, in an art situation rather than a public situation, things will perhaps be different. And I think that by taking things out of conventional patterns, like objects out of the, out of the uh, ordinary world and incorporating them into art, or in turning ordinary art processes on their heads, you increase the sense that people have that there are possibilities in life, that you can actually try anything. What the heck? All you can do is fail. No big deal. What do you think, Sam? We're what, about eight months or so? We don't even know when we're going. Like, we don't know where we're going now. We don't even know <laughs> where we're going to put this or when we're going to do it. But that's the way we plan. We have other things to do, too. <laughs> if you find out in the woods a, a, a tree that's just absolutely a straight pole, it's, it's 
probably not very interesting unless it's in a minimal artist's work. If you find a tree that's all crooked and curved, and you've often seen them in artwork, and they attach a few feathers on it or something, and you've got a beautiful piece of, of art, so to speak. In 1997, uh, Sam and Bill restaged of Fireflies and Ferris Wheels in Germany, in Magdeburg, at the Monastery of Our Lady. And here you see that installation. And what you may see easily here is that um, the works are site-specific. They're draped one place a certain way. The next place they take on a new configuration as a function of the spaces you're working with. Yes. Just like Carousel Upstairs, um, Sam's piece in the big show you might remember that it was in the Icon several years ago, and it came down like a chandelier uh, through the staircase. And then when it was decided to put it in big, um, Sam had notions about how to reconfigure it into that sort of circular, sort of carousel-like like pattern. So um, t t tell us about um, the installation here in this monastery. Well, we, <clears throat> you can see the big steel beam that holds the place together. Well, first of all, it's a beautiful building because it had a Roman bottom that somehow or other it mm. lost. It, the church collapsed down to the foundations, kind of. So then they put a Gothic top on it. Right. So the architecture was very unusual, just beautiful, really, for us. It was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, while we were installing the piece, they, uh, there was a fellow, in, well, they had a big organ in there too, was a fellow re, uh, doing uh, some he was going to do a recital on Bach, and he was practicing. So while we were putting this stuff up, we had this music in the background. It was just like, oh my god. <laughs> it was fantastic. And uh, we had this squeaky thing that, well, first of all, to get those things up there, uh, <laughs> we didn't know how that would happen. And uh, I had my slingshot I brought along with a rope on and I just shoot a, a, a bolt <laughs> over the top of the rod, and then I would take and keep pulling up heavier ropes so that we could pull this stuff up. Well, we were struggling so hard that the Germans finally gave in and, and brought us a machine that we could do that with. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, <coughs> the, the, uh, the whole process of this is a, it's amazing because we had probably about six women sewing for us uh, with very heavy duty sewing machines uh, and uh, very, very precise sewing, I must admit. And, uh, so that, that was kind of fun. There was so much noise, and the organ music, it's just, it was just like a John Cage recital or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, it, it was so much fun to put up. And, and the fact that Sam brought, uh, he, would, he would always find stuff in the neighborhood. And in this case, we, we ordered like, uh, I don't know how many different mirrors he had, like whole boxes <laughs> full of mirrors showed up. He had brought along a lot of metal things that we bolted together various shapes that he had fabricated in Washington. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, interplay. And, and the funny thing about, I mean, the, the great thing about Sam Gilliam is that a lot of the stuff that we produce, or I, I help produce, I go, yuck, this is not going to make it, you know? And he would always have a way of staging it that became beautiful. So that was just, it was just such a treat to have that happen with things that you thought you're never going to be able to save this one. And it, it always turned out well. <coughs> yeah, I, I, just to back up a little bit, because um, both in the, uh, the clips you saw the, and uh, also what was, what's being said about Sam visiting uh, Bill out in an arena in the country is that uh, he speaks fond, fond, very fondly of how important the natural setting was to his work. But he um, came from Washington. <laughs> That's not natural. <laughs> well, I, I suppose in addition to that, any other, uh, other aspects of, um, he talks about the, the sound, well, he's a oh, color, the barn thing. He's a about color field birth. painter. Yeah. And he comes out to beautiful colored fields. Yeah. Right? right exactly. I mean, I don't know if that, if that worked, but <laughs> I'll go with it. <laughs> Sam would approve of it. <laughs> What was the barn? You told me the story, the barn story about he was sleeping out of the barn and there was an owl or something in the floor? Oh, no, that was Peter Plagens. Oh. Oh, it was another artist. Oh. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I got that wrong. Uh, oh, well, maybe <laughs> I, well, whatever. <laughs> okay. there, there was certainly were owls there. There's no question about it. <laughs> and they would take care of the whatever, the mice. And they were just, they were just uh, transient my, uh, owls. They wouldn't stay once they cleaned out all the environment. 
Mm -hmm. they, they get done. <laughs> um, well, I suppose, uh, speaking of nature, we can speak a bit about water here in this particular instance with a work that you saw in the lobby when you came in. It's Phelps 8, and it's one of about near, uh, around two dozen mixed media collages that you did with uh, uh, a Sam uh, in 2016. And that summer, Sam and Bill followed the Olympics in, in Rio. And I think you now can get to the title and what it's referring to. Um, and um, uh, can you tell us about this, this project, this particular series? And the, the, the subject was obviously Michael Phelps, but was there something that was uh, connected in other ways to that no, we were subject? No, we were listening to the TV or something, and you know, they were announcing that he'd just won all these things, and Sam comes up with titles, and that just bang, that's the title. <laughs> you know, it's like, that, that's it. Oh. And, uh, I, Mel, Mel was involved uh -huh. with, with that, with the Phelps 8, and uh, I like what she said that you had mentioned to her, said to, you, said to her that uh, there was Sam and Bill watching the television, watching and making, watching and making, <laughs> watching and making, and I really like that particular rhythm uh, uh -huh. of you coming uh, to create this particular work. Well, there were a lot of grad students around helping. I mean, we had a lot of them there. And uh, <coughs> so, did you have pictures of the piece itself? Is that on somewhere? Uh, uh, of, of, the, of the piece we were making while we were making these for the uh, Biennale. Oh, it, oh, that's coming up. Am I jumping ahead? There you go. That was great. That's a great. <laughs> speaking of which, is a great segue. Yes, <laughs> okay. concurrently with the, the making of the Phelps series, Sam oh, and Bill is. were uh, uh, working on a, uh, a project. Uh, that was aimed for the uh, Venice Biennale in, in, 20, in 2017. Yeah, the French Pavilion. I, he w Sam had so many shows in Venice, uh, not in Venice, but in uh, Paris. So the, uh, the French must have adopted him, and, I, and so they asked him to do the piece in front of their pavilion. At the, you know. And it would, Yves Klein Blue would be the, the title of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Some of you may be familiar with that, but Yves Klein was an important uh, artist in the, in the 60s, and he was well known for being identified by a single color, uh, International Klein Blue, which you see here. It's an ult it's a specially prepared ultramarine, I think, that has its own particular identity. I mean, I recall in the early 60s when this came to light and we're watching things going on, I recall in a gallery in Paris, uh, nude women uh, rolling around an international Klein Blue on canvases, and I thought, boy, that's, that's contemporary. <laughs> oh, 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 golly. But uh, here you were. What's you, after contemporary, do you know? Pardon? What's going to be after contemporary? Um, Post-contemporary. Oh, <laughs> post-contemporary. <laughs> Gee, I never thought of that. <laughs> so you, the two of you worked out, worked here and in, in out, out out in an arena to, to make the materials mm -hmm. for it, right? Mm -hmm. To get it to move it yep. together? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I was going to bring his shoes along. And I called him. I talked to him yesterday. And I said, Sam, I want to take your shoes along and, oh. and auction them off. He says, no, no, I'm coming back. <laughs> 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 so. Well, here in, in nature, the preparations, uh, I don't know if you've, you've seen uh, the completed work. It's quite extraordinary. It's draped across the portico to the Giardini's entrance to uh, the central pavilion. And here is uh, Eve Klein Blue. <laughs> quite something. Yeah. This pavilion entrance, entrance for the various Biennales will change in color, like they will sort of redo the coloration of the facade. Do you know? I, I thought how perfect to have it painted all white for this particular Biennale for his work. Well, there's a lot of work that goes into it. So apparently there's some guy that brought in some big object uh, into some building. I'm not sure of the artist, but you know. uh, apparently it cost them $6 million to get that piece through the roof and down there. Oh, know. my goodness. So they do some work on it. But yeah. those were the Italians, they, you know, <laughs> a little more showy than the rest. <laughs> oh. um. Well, here we go. Sam, as you know, couldn't be here with us this evening. 
but uh, he certainly is in spirit and in his own words. Uh, last week, uh, Sam sent Bill a statement about their collaborations over the years. In fact, oh, Bill said he can't read it because he'd probably start tearing up. So I said, I'm happy to do it. I have loved and prospered for 50 years in my engagement with Bill Wiege. His willingness to be experimental, to bring the love and labors of the land into the workshop, nourished my art and my soul. Nothing was precious, everything was up for grabs. That says so much, doesn't it? Nothing precious, anything to make art this beautiful and wonderful. Working with Bill is like driving fast in a sports car through winding and uncharted territory. While Bill was doing this for me, he was also doing it full time for many other artists. We all took the collective inventions of the print shop back to our studios. We are richer for it. Uh, a, a, a wonderful celebration of an extraordinary collaboration. <laughs> Bill has uh, described his collaborations with other artists as an interpreter, okay? And to this end, it reminds me of the, of the master printer artist model of, say, Frank Stella and Ken Tyler. However, in addition to being a superb technical facilitator, an idea man, Bill Wiggy is also a fine artist in his own right. <laughs> now we can ask him to speak towards his own art. I mean, it's an extraordinary uh, 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 work, work on paper on, on the screen. Well, I'm, I'm very eclectic. So I do a lot of different things. I, I basically, uh, recently the show in Chicago kind of put me back on the map as a social uh, commentator. And, uh, you know, I did, I did things. I did a piece in here uh, in this book that's called Pieces Patriotic. It was a portfolio I did when I was a grad student. Uh, and uh, I, I, was, I went to New York with, uh, with this portfolio. Uh, I, had, I took three of my books. They had 25 pages. It, it was, I, that's why my shoulder's out of joint. <laughs> um, with Warrington Colescott, took his people there, took his students there. Uh, I, I sold a copy to the Museum of Modern Art, the Brooklyn Museum, and the New York Public Library. That was my first outing as a student. So uh, friends of mine who were blue chip guys, they hadn't sold a piece yet to the modern art. So it's like, whoa. So I didn't realize that I you know, had accomplished something early on. And, and this whole thing is in part of why I got sent to the Venice Biennale. Uh, I, you know, my, big, my big thing there was impeach Nixon posters. And the second biggest thing was working with Ed Boucher. And we, we didn't have any money. It was like almost gone. You know, the kind of mentality that the government has is just, I mean, these, these people that work for the government in, in these positions where they can't, they can't say anything about the government, they got to keep their mouth shut about everything. I wasn't doing that. Uh, and I got in trouble for it, obviously. But uh, I'll continue to do it. I mean, I, you get, we got to speak up. I mean, we got we to say something about what's going on. And, and that's where I've done a whole other series of things. I just, I've, I've been told by my psychiatrist that I gotta <laughs> slow down, you know, <laughs> slow down. And so that's almost impossible for somebody like myself to slow down. Uh, the only thing that makes me really slow down is that physically I just have to. My body ain't working like it used to. So uh, I slowed down a little bit but I haven't stopped <laughs> thinking at all. And I think that I have to do another whole body of work that is, is a social comment again. And I've started it, so Valerie's gonna hand out mash books. Um, and if anybody wants more of them, let me know. Uh, I could do it. If you want a big poster about some particular thing that would be environmental or whatever, guns or whatever, I could help you with that. Uh, you can commission me. Uh, so uh, the, the, the last commission that, that Sam and I did actually had, another, uh, had a third party. And 
one of the reasons I met Sam in the first place is, is this third party. And he's sitting in the second row with my wife right there. He, he, when Sam came to town to talk about how generous he was, he suggested to Don, because Don had bought a lot of his work in New York, he couldn't afford uh, Morris Lewis, he couldn't <laughs> afford uh, a number of those artists of that period. Kenneth Nolan. Kenneth Nolan, okay. <laughs> and uh, so, so he bought Sam's work. And uh, Sam said, he says, Don, he says, you really should buy some work from local people. You should really, you know. Oh, ah, I was right on scene there. And, and Don, over the years, has commissioned me to do quite a few pieces for him. I've done large pieces. I've done small pieces. Uh, so, it, so was Sam talking to his collector friend. And his collector friend was good to me. Um, so my work is very eclectic. I, I, like, I like to experiment. I hate printmaking. I absolutely hate it. <laughs> It's boring, you know, and I told my stu you know, when I was a student, I, I got in there, I was in the printmaking area, and you had to make 12 pieces. 12, you had to do an addition of 12 that all looked alike. Well, the first one should have never been made in the first place. I mean, you know, it was so ugly or bad or whatever. So I kind of turned that around in the department. I, I thought, you know, if you're an artist you, and you're doing the work, do what you want. Don't don't make a lot of them when you're just wasting paper and ink, you know. Uh, so that the whole philosophy kind of changed in the department after that, and people be became instead of printers, they became artists, because there's a fine line. And the ego thing, being a printer, is difficult too, because when you have someone important like Sam working with you, you've got a, you could you could have an ego, a big ego, but it's not going to work out really well, because then you're not going to be friends for 45 years, you know? Uh, and so it, it's a tough road. But I got so much inspiration from these visiting artists that, that it's, it was just amazing. And, and I still continue to get it. And it's like, this is why I started Picnic Point Press. Because what <laughs> was so important to me was a visiting artist program that the art department had. I learned more, I felt more, I my whole artistic career was because of that. My very first artist that I really worked with was Jack Beale. And guess when we met? We met at the time of the Dow demonstration. We, mm. we made banners that went across a bridge that used to be between the Science Hall and the Union. And we made banners there, and the cops ripped them down as fast as we could make them, but it didn't stop us. And it's like, uh, so I submitted my relationship with, with, with uh, uh, Jack at that time, and it continued with other artists that came along. Uh, so it, for me, that's the kind of thing that the students should be doing. I mean, I mean, the university should be doing more of. Tanda Press is having hard times, oh, excuse me, Picnic Point Press is having hard times because they're not enough art students anymore. What's happened is that the country has gone goofy, and we don't put enough creative minds out there. You can't start a small business now without creative minds. And it's, they're not there. So you're gonna fail. Art is so important. <laughs> well, we didn't talk about my art yet, did we? <laughs> well, you know, you, 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 you know, I mean, what, I, my art is my art. I your mean, art is your art, and what I find fascinating, I mean, many things with Bill's art is that this, this, this fluidity between you know, lyrical abstraction. I mean, one of the great colorists, and Sam too, which I think we haven't talked about that, but your color sensibilities are just so, so vivid. Oh, I worked lyrical. in dark. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, his, and his political, and his political points of view. Remember, it was like two years ago, I went out to visit you to, to choose a work. You were just about to have your Pace Editions show, which was very exciting. And, um, and we're, I'm looking at the new work, which is, is abstract. And uh, I went off to the um, bathroom. And it was full of art. And while I'm in the bathroom, um, over the toilet was what I thought was a reproduction of, of Henri Matisse's Harmony in Red. And it was really very, very beautiful. It was sort of low. So I had to sort of like, 
get down to see it because I really wanted to know what that was. Well, it was a woodcut. And the inscription, and it was a very fine emulation of Matisse's harmony in red, but um, the caption below, all of a sudden I saw acid rain. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and I said, I came, I said, Bill, uh, that's extraordinary. I mean, because see, I, I didn't know the political side of his work. And he said, oh, I got some more of that stuff. So he, he comes back with a box full of framed woodcuts from a series called Mother Nature Never Loses. And it was it, all about climate change, all about the destruction of the environment. And I thought, well, this is another, another side. And I said, gee, I would, uh, we were doing a show on, on, on the, the, the political artist. I said, I would love these in that show. He said, oh, take them all. <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> you, you were very, very generous. And so that suite of woodcuts, which some of you may recall in that exhibition, is in our permanent collection. And it is that other side of what you see on the screen, which I think um, reflects an extremely rich and extraordinary life as an artist. So. Oh. I'm one lucky rascal, that's all. You certainly are. <laughs> <laughs> We're lucky to know you. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming this evening. Of course, thanks to Bill, and of course, thanks to Sam. I, I hope you enjoyed the evening. <laughs>